Sponsorship of today's podcast comes from our friends at D'Addario and Company and their new nickel bronze premium uncoated strings. Whether you are a traditional bluegrass picker or an emerging modern player, D'Addario's new premium uncoated nickel bronze series captures the unique sound of your acoustic guitar. These strings are engineered to bring out the distinctive tonal characteristics of your guitar and allow its true voice to shine through. Expanding D'Addario's industry-leading acoustic string line, Nickel Bronze feature an innovative combination of nickel-plated phosphor bronze wrapped around a high-carbon NY steel core. The nickel-plated wrap wire provides maximum clarity and resonance as well as harmonically rich overtones for enhanced playability. We had some of these strings at last November's Fretboard Summit, and folks absolutely love them. We've since gotten some official packets of it. Those were prototype packets back in November. They were awesome. So reveal the unique character of your guitar with Nickel Bronze from D'Addario. For more info and for exclusive online content, visit, visit nickelbronze.daddario.com. Thanks so much to D'Addario for sponsoring the Fretboard Journal podcast. Hey everyone, this is Jason Verlindi, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal, and this is the Fretboard Journal's 110th podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for subscribing to our podcast via iTunes or Stitcher or however you do it. I do want to give a quick plug. If you are into guitar-related podcasts, there are a couple of good ones I want to recommend to you while you wait for your latest Fretboard Journal or Fretboard Journal podcast episode. Uh, there's Eric Dawes, the Fret Files podcast, which I can't recommend enough. It is uh, basically Eric Daw fielding questions from people around the world on guitar repair and guitar restoration. It is immensely entertaining as well as informative. Uh, Eric works out of Emerald City Guitars here in Seattle and also builds and designs pinup custom guitars. And he is a incredible resource and uh it comes out once a month i i just love listening to it it's like car talk you love it's great to hear people posing him questions and and to get an unfiltered answer from a luthier uh the other podcast that i've been enjoying a lot lately is steve dawson the canadian musician who now lives in nashville has a new podcast called music makers and soul shakers and uh steve is clearly a kindred spirit of the fretboard journal because he's featured many of our favorite artists. Uh, he's interviewed Bill Frizzell and Joe Henry and Mark Ribot and many others and done a really exceptional job with that. And, uh, it's great to hear all these guys go through their influences and a lot more. So check out music makers and soul shakers. If you need more podcasts in your life. So this podcast that you are about to listen to is an interesting one. About 11 years ago when Michael Simmons and I started the fretboard journal, our elevator pitch for what this magazine would be like was it would be filled with the stories you would hear in the back of your favorite guitar store, whether that was a luthier talking about an interesting instrument or working on one or a couple of great players swapping guitars and talking about their influences. We wanted to capture all those stories you don't read about in any other guitar magazine. And I'd like to think that we've done an okay job with that so far. Um, this interview that you're about to hear is very much in that spirit. Uh, Bill Frizzell and Matt Munisteri both happened to be in Seattle a month and a half ago, I guess. And I wanted to have them come into our office and to do a Facebook Live session for us. Facebook Live videos you've probably seen on your newsfeed. They're basically off the cuff. You put your phone in front of your face uh, or the face of a couple of your favorite musicians and you start broadcasting. These guys did an exceptional live session. They played, a, I think, three tunes. Uh, it is available on our Facebook page still. I will say that we also have posted the video uh, from our better cameras with really good audio uh, onto our YouTube page. So maybe you should check that out instead of our Facebook video, which has the crude iPhone video and audio. But uh, anyways, these guys did an amazing session. And afterwards, I asked Matt and Bill if they were up for doing a little interview, a little conversation for a podcast. They covered a ton of ground. Bill talks about Johnny Smith. Matt asked Bill about his time with Vernon Reed. They talk about James Blood Ulmer. Bill has a transcendental moment with Ornette Coleman that he uh, sheepishly tells us about. I don't know that Bill totally knew that we were recording this as a podcast. He does now. I think about 10 minutes into this interview, he's actually asking if we were actually taping, which we were. Um, but it's a great conversation. It is a deep dive into what makes Bill tick and what makes Matt tick. 
And these two guys are two of my favorite people. So just being a fly on the wall, listening to them talk is a blast for me. I hope it is for you as well. The first voice you're going to hear is, of course, Bill Frizzell, our dear friend, um, talking a little bit about uh, Johnny Smith. And uh, we just kind of started the tape midway through his thought process, but you'll be able to pick it up fairly easily. Thank you so much for tuning in. Fretboard Journal 36, mailing to everybody right now. You'll probably see it in a couple weeks if you are a subscriber, depending on your postal carrier. Can't thank you enough for supporting the magazine and for supporting Fretboard Journal and all of our various projects. Matt will be at the Fretboard Summit in October if you want to see him in action. He is truly an amazing player and one of my favorite people in this little universe. So uh, hopefully I will see some of you there, and uh, it's going to be fun. Fretboardsummit.com. corny old guy around right. and I didn't appreciate him but I did take these lessons with him and then and it, you know so I had this connection with him and then you mentioned that song old folks and I had I tried to play that a few times with my friend Joey Barron this really loves that song and we played it a long long ago mm. and then there's this recording of Johnny Smith oh, over the years my appreciation of Johnny Smith has just grown immensely and so this morning I was like I had like seven minutes or something and I was like oh shit I gotta so I, I just wanted to I was checking him out playing that mm -hmm. and, it, and I but I didn't have time to get it all. I went, oh shit if I would only had like another hour what, I could have a, got the chord. was his version a version of the tune that spoke to you, or was it? Yeah, just super yeah. beautiful. And then hearing it now, after whatever my little, you know, coming across the tune every once in a while here and there. And then as my appreciation for him grows, and then hearing him play it now, and after what you said, that you said about the E chord, and then I'm thinking, well, he's playing a. B flat chord. Right, yeah. It's like all these, and I want, and I wish I had had time to. Well, no one plays it the way I just played it, or you know, yeah. not that I <laughs> played that perfectly, but that starting with those chords and playing that way, I was surprised. But but you got some of it from that, from you, Willard, from from the, the old, very yeah from the source early right? stuff from the guy that wrote it yeah, and then. And then I was surprised that there were these few things that I heard Johnny Smith do that were in, in that, and I love that. Yeah, stuff. that really <laughs> surprises me too. Johnny Smith is someone that you know. Whenever I've listened to the records, he's it's a totally inspiring technique and like evenness and beautiful chord work and stuff. But I haven't found like the tune or something that I really connect to, so I haven't yeah. gotten. That was so my deep into him. For all, I guess for a long time, it, and it's all. It, it, I'm also. It's very kind of worked out, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm. Actually, like the fact that when we did this. What we were doing earlier, we didn't really know what we were going to do, and I mm -hmm. like that when that happens when you don't know what. And he's not one. I think he had things really mapped out. Yeah, I think so. I think that always wasn't really what I was attracted to. But but hearing him now over after all, there, there's there's one uh, man with the blue guitar where it's just him playing guitar alone. Mm -hmm. That's have you ever heard that? No, I don't know. That might get, and he plays folk song like more folk songs and. I don't know what it is. It's all. just this really pure, beautiful, soulful stuff. I, I had a personal experience with his music when I was going through a, a, a divorce and it was like, you know, just horrific. And, and one day I really wanted to hear that song, I'll Be Around. Do you know that Alec Wilder song? Oh, yeah. 
and I went looking for versions of it and I couldn't find the Sinatra version of it and I'm thumbing through all this stuff and finally I find a Johnny Smith record and I look and he has that version. I was like, wow, cool. And I put vinyl and I put on the record and it was like, da, 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 da. I was like, no, that's not what I want to hear and tore it off. So I think that might have been actually oh, the last sorry. time that I, that I listened to him. But, you know, that's a very, very hyper subjective experience, you know. When someone's tempo doesn't match <laughs> yeah. your heart, you know. Well, this other, you should check out the one I'm talking about. And that's where that, uh, you know, I play Shenandoah all the time, that song. Right. And that kind of came from him. Oh, interesting. Him, like, you know, he did. That, that's all just lifted from his. Oh, wow. His stuff. Cool. So when I play that song, now that song has all these other associations with Charlie Hayden, or, or uh, it's it keeps mm -hmm. associations for you. Yeah, just I've been playing it for a while, and but it kind of started. Most people knew it from when they sang it in elementary school, or right. something, but kind of started with Johnny Smith from me on that. Is, are we, are you taping this now? Oh shit, sorry, no profanity. Okay, good. It's encouraged y'all. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if it was all being taped. We, uh, we don't have to be with it. No, it's cool, it's totally fine. I don't think I said anything that would be offensive to Johnny Smith fans. No, no, that's my, and I'm, I consider myself a fan anyway, so. Um, Bill, I was asking you before, telling you about the, the when I first was listening to your playing in the and early really, 80s, you know. It really surprised me that we were probably in the same room a bunch of times. But no, we I didn't think so. Them. I mean, I was, you know, I was in high school and then I was in college and I wasn't living in New York when I was in college, so I'd come home and do stuff. Yes, we were in but, the same but room I was at a lot of at gigs. Some of those yeah. gigs you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, you were, but you were playing and I was listening. Well, I was listening at some of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, at some point, I, I remember after some show of yours, I thanked you for the music and you said, you gestured to your pedal board and was like, it's really all this. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> I don't think so. That was, that was a little later. That was at Visiones when, um, wow, when you were playing there with Lovano. Yeah. yeah. I had no idea because we didn't meet I don't think I actually met you in person till what's the name of that club um, on the, the ear end yeah yeah that was incredible yeah that's a really fun fun gig John that was Kelso so does awesome. every Sunday like it's like real you just that's felt a like I was going I mean just like hearing music like just right in your face like yeah. that. It's a nice sounding room too. Yeah. So, you know, people are often talking there and hanging out, but the music itself is so, it's all wooden, you know, and it's a wooden yeah. ceiling. And something about the way things bounce off that room, it, it always sounds really nice. And I don't think it, were even anybody using microphones? No, or there's no microphones. It's, it's just like, it's like if you were. Yeah, I have a little amp. I usually bring a little Princeton, you know, but keep it at a moderate volume. Yeah, I was glad John John Rogers brought you down there, right? Yeah. And um, I think I saw you another time in, you know what, actually, I think it might have been after that, in uh, that festival in the north of Paris, when I was there with one of the Bernstein groups. I think that was the oh. festival where I saw you. I think so. Just said a quick hello. But yeah, no, I, you know, I, you know, that whole discovery period for me in the 80s of, in New York was you were, you know, one of the people that was playing, but it was an incredible time because I had played a lot of bluegrass and played different sorts of stuff, but left the banjo just feeling like it wasn't, I didn't feel connected to it anymore. I, I would pick it up and play it and I didn't want to hear it anymore. And that's a really bad sign. So I was really kind of lost for a bunch of years didn't really know what to do and uh where did you grow up 
I grew up in Brooklyn. Oh, oh in, in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. So, yeah. But when you said go into New York, you're talking about going to going New into York the city. From, from Brooklyn. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. that's a, No, I mean, everyone in my family is like, you talk about going into the city. You know, you go into the city for work. And yeah. Stuff, so. um, but I remember seeing James Blood, I think, was the first thing I saw that really just totally freaked that me was, out. It made me feel like... freaked me out, too. Yeah. I mean, I'd already been freaked out plenty of times prior, you know, but that was a moment in yeah. New York. He, totally. That was another one of those mind-altering... Yeah. But and, maybe... So you're talking about hearing him... Were you in high school? Um, by the time I heard Blood, I was probably in college. Yeah, I graduated high school in 82. I probably, it was probably like 83, 84 or something. And when wow, I was going out to all so those decoding society gigs, I had already, when I was in high school, I would go see Vernon Reed with um, Defunct. And yeah, that so I, went, I used to go to all the, I guess that was my... At the Ritz or at the Pep Lounge and stuff like that. Yeah, it's wild. But I mean, it was such a different town. I, I saw the primetime band at just a loft in Chelsea and there were maybe like 20 people, you know? And it was just a kind of, like, a, it wasn't a open to the public thing, it was just you knew it was gonna happen. And I forget yeah. who told me about it. And I went, wow. and I went with my cousin. And I remember there, there weren't that many people there, but they played a full, you know, like, I mean, a three hour show, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that was probably like 84. Yeah, I saw that. The first time I saw Ornette was soon after I met my wife in Belgium and we heard about this. Now it's one of the most famous festivals in the, the North Sea Jazz Festival. Yeah. But at the time, yeah, there's some festival in Holland and Ornette's playing. And uh, Should I tell you this story? Yeah. I, may, am I making this totally public? I'm, it's, it's one of these, I guess I'll just tell you. I almost hate talking about it, but I'm going to talk about it. Uh, you know, Ornette is major, huge, you know, one of the ones for me. And I had just met who was to become my wife, and we, and I'd never seen Ornette, and I knew he was going to be playing, so we drove all night, kind of got lost in the countryside got there to this big it's in this huge convention center thing yeah and we make it in time and i go and he, he was playing in a big concert hall and it was it was um burn nix was playing and shannon jackson and blood and i think jamal Dean was playing they, it was early 1978 yeah. so it was early wow, prime blood time. and burn wow. and and it, unless it was charles i'm sorry I should check to make sure, but, and they were, it was in this big place and he was really far away and he had like this kind of purple glowing suit and he was playing violin and I was like, and I hadn't really heard any of his electric stuff, you know, it was just shocking. Um, but it was, I was just so happy that I got to see, there he is, you know, down there, I got to see him. And so then as the day goes on, I went. I just went and saw Oscar Peterson, and then I saw Stefan Grappelli, and walking around, and there's just millions of thousands yeah. of people just all over the place. And at one point, I went and I got a I got a Coke to drink, and I'm drinking the Coke, and and this guy comes right up in my face and said, "Where'd you get that Coke?" And it was Ornette asked me where and. So I thought that was I couldn't believe that. You know, there's like the, and he came right up to me and asked me, and I just said, you know, over there. And he went over there and whatever. So then I went, and then this is where it gets. Um, I shouldn't be saying this in public. This is like some sort of. Uh, So, so then the day goes on, you know, I'm, I went and saw some more stuff, you know, K 
can't remember if I saw Anthony Braxton that I went, you know, it's, and I'm getting kind of tired and there's too many people and it's like, man, you know, more hours and we hadn't really slept the night before. And, um, and this is in Holland and I swear to God that I wasn't high or anything. I was completely, I wasn't doing drugs or anything, right? But some more hours go by and I'm getting really tired and I, there, I, and there's just too many people, too much commotion. So I found this empty stairwell. There was a door. I opened the door and there's like nothing there. There was just a stairwell. I thought, I need to just rest for a minute. So I opened the door and I, I'm just sitting there quietly. And there's a knock on the door. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. I open the door and, what's back here? And it was Ornette again and he went away. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. No, it sounds about right. And then, you know, years later, I got to meet him, and I got to play with him a little bit. And, yeah. But I don't know what that was all about. But now it's out there. I, I hesitated to talk about it too much, because it doesn't even seem real. Yeah, it always seems to me that I've actually, I think I'm coming out of a three-month period where similar things have been going on with me almost constantly. <laughs> it's really weird. Like, I've been having dreams and then wake up and the person calls, like, that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. all the time. Yeah. So, yeah, when, you know, when you're open or whatever, that's how things work. I think that Ornette was definitely one of those people, though, right? I mean, I think he was very, very open to things. Um, did you know... There was a composer, Vito Ricci. Did you ever meet him? The... No, I don't know. So I guess I was like 18 or... No, I was probably like 16, 17. And a cousin of mine knew him through some like avant-garde theater stuff. And he was in Soho and, you know, was doing avant-garde stuff. And I was just playing electric guitar, you know, at that point. And trying to get out of banjo land. And, um, and I went over to his house and he told me about having taken he took a lesson from Ornette and first thing Ornette asked him to do was play one of his pieces and he played this composition that was all like kind of electronic and um, you know there's no like tonal center in his stuff it was very like different sounds and sort of sound collage stuff and Ornette was like do you have a score for this and he said yeah I do and he handed Ornette this piece of visual art that he created that had you know various colors and things going on and uh and Ornette looked at it and was like, and kept on staring at the picture and listening to the music and kind of screwing up his face and being like, I don't know, this is the score for it, really? And then finally he rotated the score just 90 degrees and held it sideways and, oh, yeah, of <laughs> course. <laughs> so I don't know if it's totally true if I'm telling it right, but that's, not... that's as I remember it when, I was, when it was told to me. Um, I wish I brought my copy of Smash and Scatteration oh, for you man. to sign. How many copies do you think were pressed of that? I don't know. 500 maybe? <laughs> I love that. Record. Maybe even more because back then people actually bought those things. Yeah. I remember that was one of the first things that was... It was like a really big deal that it's going to be on a going to be cd they just had just started making oh really i had CDs. it on vinyl yeah and i th i think it was some kind of we're gonna try this and see if mm -hmm. for for uh for you guys or anyone listening this is this record that he did a duo with vernon reed back in the day that was really cool talking about um, oh what i was starting to say ago. earlier was that when Stephen Bernstein did this record of all this Sly Stone music, he had Bernie Worrell on the, oh, on the, on the disc, amazing. which was great. And Vernon played some guitar. Oh, yeah. And Charlie Burnham was on the record as you know a regular member of the Millennial Territory Orchestra. And I realized when we were recording, on the second day of recording, that... Without any exaggeration, I would say that one person in that room was on my turntable every minute for about two years. 
like had been because yeah. I was going between Blood's Odyssey record with with Charles Burnham. Yeah, yeah, and all kinds of P funk was I was always listening to, and then Vernon, you know, with the Decoding Society, and then the first Living Color record, you know, yeah. and Defunct, you know, sold his own Defunct stuff. Like those, those records were in constant rotation, you know. And when you were talking about being in the same room earlier, like that business, being, you know, I was like, my God, I've actually been in a room with all these people's music nonstop. Yeah. You know, that was really great. And great then thrill. To, to end up, that's what happens to me too, where you, wait a minute now I'm playing with these people now you know that's when it happened to me yeah. for quite a while <laughs> that I still can't believe you know stuff that changed my life and then you just plug away and then I never got well, to see you and Lee Konitz uh, and I wish I'd made some of those shows that was I've gotten to play with him quite a bit yeah and, we just just a, I guess it was about a year ago. We did a tour in w- with this uh, guitar player Yaka Bro. His, yeah, I love his playing. It was him and Thomas Morgan, bass player. We it was wild going to um, went to Iceland and Greenland and the Faroe Islands and way up there. Wow. I've never been to some of those places. I played a gathering of the Sami tribes, the indigenous peoples of the Laplands, years ago, (laughs) with a Western swing band. See, this is these are the differences between our gigs. This is like I have a million gig stories that are like what? Um, The guy that's the uh, there's a homicide detective for the south of Sweden and a homicide detective for the north of Sweden, and the guy that's the homicide detective for the north came to New York City. Walked into the rodeo bar, this place that used to be. Wait a second, Avenue. this is you're ta- this is real. Yeah, right? this is all real, and saw this Western swing band that I happened to be playing with that night, and was like, I want you guys to come to Sweden and play for the gathering of the Sami tribes. So, I mean, we kind of got paid in, you know, reindeer meat. It was like very <laughs> low pay, but we got to hang out in February, way in hours north of the Arctic Circle, and. Wow race reindeer and do all this crazy stuff and then like you know see the sami people and you know i mean it was it was really an incredible experience but that's the sort of bizarre thing that we get to do as musicians that you know these things maybe they happen every couple of years maybe they happen only once you know but that was a really fun one take you all over the place and I asked him. I asked him if he, you know, if it was how he's able to take a couple of weeks off from work, you know, being the only homicide detective for the North of Sweden. He was like, "Oh, it's, it's, there's there's only one one homicide a year in Sweden." And I was like, "Really?" And I said, "Well, there's it a lot of pressure then to solve it." He goes, "No, no, no. It's always the boyfriend." <laughs> oh man, I'm like, laughing. <laughs> I was wondering if these guys have any questions. Tell us about this guitar that you brought, Bill. This one? Yeah. It's a... It's a Gibson Hummingbird. And... uh, My good friend, Terry Terrell, who lives in... West Seattle he had two of them I think he still has the other one and it's like is it 61 it's kind of an earlier one you know before they made those adjustable bridges and it's just it's great super comfortable it, it, some this, guitars from this time from Gibson the necks I just love yeah they're really comfy it's almost on the verge of being too thin but not quite I'm I'm on the brink of getting a guitar 
that is really kind of a crazy thing to do. I'm gonna have to get a loan and do all kinds of things to get this thing, but. What is that? <laughs> it, it got a hold of me. It's, I've, you know, until I got this L5, I was all about like the less popular guitars because, you know, number one, like who could afford the other ones? But I also, I really love deeply. I mean, like my L, I had an L7 that was given to me on my 12th oh, birthday. Yeah that was belonged to my great uncle. And so I grew up playing that L7, which I thought was a great guitar, and everyone was like, oh, but L5s are better. Is it an L7 from what time? It's a 47. So it's the it's bigger than that. It's bigger, yeah. It's And eventually I, I wound up playing this guitar and really kind of fell in love with it like 15 years ago and got this. Um, but I, I played a whole bunch of OM28s recently, like from the era and there's a 1930 that I'm <laughs> going to try to get oh man it has issues sounds like so you have not... some issues yourself. <laughs> yeah I'm going to have some issues let me tell you wow so we'll see if I can pull it off but OM what? 28 it's the rosewood so it's, it's like, like fancier kind of it's one? not fancy no it's just Really, oh, it's really like, expensive. Yeah. But it's it's rosewood. Pack? It's rosewood, yeah. It just it has like this it just pops like you can you can lay into it, you can play gentle on it and it just gives up everything right there and the bass is ridiculous and it's just I just had so much fun. So I'm going to I'm going to spend some more time with it. I'm going to try to spend a couple of days with it and see what I think. Do, do you use different guitars for would you use that guitar? instead of this guitar well i'm sort of at this, this point i'm kind like of a... like i mean i've had tons of guitars but i'm kind of like a three guitar person now like this acoustic 1930 l5 is what i would use for most acoustic music where i have to be heard you know just because it's really and you kind of can't beat the just the... Like sometimes you really have to be heard and so you need an instrument that's going to put it out, you know. And then if I get to use an amp, I, 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 you know, if I have a choice between playing this with a mic or using a guitar with an amp, it depends how loud the rest of the band is, you know. But if I use an amp, I use the 150, a Charlie Christian pickup 150. You've seen that guitar. That I really love that guitar. But I don't have a flat top that really, like, I'm in love with. And so that's what this would be if I can pull it off. Wow. I'm going to have to sell a lot of things, you know. Wow. And I'm going to have to have my first talk with a banker. Man. Wow. That's so great, though. You got it whittled down. I have some... It's all <laughs> spread. It's like... For now. For now, it's whittled down. Oh, man. I, pl I shouldn't even say this, but I played a great guitar Tony Marcus had the other day. Have you ever played an Epiphone recording? Uh, I've played a couple, but Tony's is like, it's the one that has this weird, severe cutaway right here. Oh, no. They're very no. kind of hyper modern looking, but they're from the 20s, like, you know, like 27, 28. Oh, yeah. I, I, I've, I've never played one. I think I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I've played a couple, and I thought they were good, but, but man, this guy... Tony Marcus, a player in San Francisco, is just a great sounding one. Like, wow. kind of puts it out like this, you know. And we were playing in a jam session with, you know, 10 other guitarists, and I felt like I played his a little bit, and it felt like I didn't need any more, you know. Oh, wow. I didn't need any more muscle. Wow, that's wild looking. Yeah, they're cool. Um, but yeah, I love this. I love this L5. But it also, um, we were saying earlier, it requires a lot. For me, it feels sometimes like I'm working with a heavy bag all the time with it. And you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it. You could play it quiet too, and it's something going. I, I think you're right. I think you can, and I probably need to learn how. You know, I think that's probably absolutely true. I notice how much the, this one's more the 
dynamic yeah, range is the much range less. Is much more compressed. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I probably have it set up pretty, you know, light. <laughs> This is lighter than I used to have it. Hey, when did you move out to to Seattle? Was it in the... 89. Oh, I didn't know you were gone from New York that long. Sort of. I mean, I'm there a lot, so right. it seems like I'm sort of there. But, but I feel like all those years um, that you were part of a few different scenes. I don't feel like you were someone that was like attached to just one thing, but you were integral in so much of the music that seemed to me to be like breathing life into the whole downtown scene in the 80s that I'm surprised you were actually that you were gone by 89 you know <laughs> um, yeah I don't I mean I still went back all the time I, I came out here with Wayne Horvitz who was also you know he he was actually the guy that booked the first week of the knitting fact, the first knitting fact. Really? I st somewhere I have a little piece of paper that has, I played there the first week that it opened. Mm -hmm. And that was because Wayne was, found some people to play there. And then that became this whole yeah, thing. Yeah, that was a great scene. It's really, it's very, very different, you know? I mean, as you know, it's just, the city feels very different. Yeah, I mean, that's everywhere here. Struggling now, being in Seattle, trying to come to Turp. Well, you see around this neighborhood. Yeah, this building right over here wasn't even there when yeah. I was here a year ago, right? Or in the fall. Yeah, it just even there. the construction yeah. thing is just out of control. Yeah. Well, I was in Nashville, for, like I said, for a week in uh, early March or end of February, and it was, I, I mean, it was just Same staggering. Thing. Like, downtown, right adjacent to downtown are whole, like, hills that they've constructed and, like, little lawns and perfect little houses every place and lampposts, and no one's living in any of them. And you can drive, actually, for, like, miles and just see, like, all new places that are empty that no one's in yet. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's just unbelievable. But it's more like houses, not big. Like Both. here it's all these Both. condos. So you, first you'd pass like, you know, units of houses and little like, you know, a area that was maybe, I don't know, a cornfield or something. And then you pass the big places. You wow. Know, but they're all just, at least, you know, a couple of months ago sitting there either under construction or just finished. And yeah. None of them housing actual human beings yet. Yeah, I guess it's just everywhere. I, I have to ask you about the power tools thing. How did that come well, about? Well, actually the same way at, with the record with Vernon, this guy David Breskin, I don't know if you know him. Mm -hmm. He used to, at that time, even when I first met him, he was known sort of as a sort of as a, he he was known as a journalist or he he wrote for Rolling Stone and then there was a magazine called Musician magazine back then and uh but the record with Vernon was his idea he he was i think he had quite a bit to do with a lot of those Shannon producing the Shannon records and mm, then okay and I can't remember how I actually met him. Somehow he knew of me and I think it started out actually as a, there was some idea, he had some idea to do something with, of James Bond theme music with John Schofield and Vernon Reed and me. Hmm. I think that was where it, I might get in trouble for, uh, but that somehow that didn't didn't pan out, and then it ended up just Vernon and me doing this thing. 
but it was produced by David Breskin and it was also such a weird time because it was right we, we had each just gotten these those Roland guitar synthesizer things right, that come I out that was and I had just gotten this featured. this uh, Oberheim drum machine it was like this time when there was, wow you know this crazy stuff was all yeah. coming out effects and MIDI and all this stuff so we were in this uh, I did a lot of recording in that uh, what was it called it was just below Canal Street on West Broadway there was oh, this yeah. little studio there that I ended up doing tons of recording in that place back then And but it was a small like about half the size of this mm -hmm. room and we just had all that stuff in there and just were but it was produced by David Breskin. And then I guess it was a couple years later, he had this idea to connect me with... Sh and I, I knew Melvin already, but to connect me with Shannon. and um, Was Laswell part of that? I can't remember. No, no it was Melvin Gibbs. I know Gibbs Melvin Gibbs was playing, but Laswell didn't do any No, no it was just anything. really um, David Breskin and... So we just met and we did the record and that we we did that was another like another I just miss those places like we recorded it at Radio City Music Hall there was a borderline abandoned it wasn't abandoned it was still there mm. but I forget up you know you you go in the back of Radio City Music Hall I can't remember how we got in there. Like you go in the alley or something, then you take an elevator. But it was an old, huge recording studio. That was maybe part of RCA or it's, something? I get. Was that who it, was based in that it big was, complex around Rockefeller Center? Well, not, it was, yeah, I mean, but it was, I forget what floor, it was way up high somewhere. Boy, somebody should have written. But I, that's where I did a lot of Zorn. Zorn did tons of stuff up there at that mm. time. So it was really cheap, but it was still like a real place. You know, the just the sound of the room. It was a, one of those big rooms where they used to do orchestra stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and it still had this stuff was still functioning. And there'd be stuff, like timpani, or there'd be big tubular bells back in the corner with dust on them or wow. there was stuff around and but that's where we recorded the power tools thing wow and then we so it was sort of you know my memory is that we were in this you know it wasn't like we were all off in booths or something we were sort of in this big room together and uh and then, wow, I can't even remember where we all, that we did a, I know we did this one tour of Europe. There's even a, I think there's some bootleg things from that tour. There was a. I think I saw you and Shannon play at the Knitting Factory. Um, I can't remember if, I, there, yeah. there was one, there was a gig that I couldn't do at the Knitting Factory where uh, uh, oh, my mind. What's the name of the guitar player that played with Mile Pete Cozy? Oh, played. Pete Cozy. It was. I did see Pete Cozy a few times. Yeah. He played. It was said Power Tools, and they had Pete Cozy, and then they had. I don't know if it was Vernon or or boy, see, I don't, I should, I'm throwing out these. Someone else sort so of they played did other the, gigs as power tools. Well, maybe it might have just been that one gig uh, that I couldn't do, but we didn't do many. There was one tour in Europe, and I know we played like at at the. It was a London, maybe London Jazz Festival or something, and that was that was supposed to have been become a album but I and I think it's around sort of as a bootleg or something mm -hmm. which was kind of cool because we've been playing 
more we were playing that music but it you know what happens when you start yeah playing so well i mean because i saw you so many times and i used to see shannon any chance i got you know um I mean, I saw him once with Pete Cozy at least, and I saw, which was a thrill because I only knew Pete Cozy from his playing on Agarta, right? The right. Miles record. That, that's... And I saw him with Jeff Lee Johnson a few times too later on. Do you know who that was? I don't know. Who that... he, he died maybe two years ago at this point, maybe three years ago. He was a Philly based player, really, really wonderful guitar player, electric, oh, wow. and just, you know, really had his own concept on the instrument oh, wow. ridiculous technique but like just channeling but really Pete Cozy player. was playing with him? no or I saw with Pete Shannon? Cozy with Shannon oh oh yeah and but I the, saw Burn Nix all the time at the knit he was like there yeah. it seemed like every Wednesday or something but I used to see him a lot but when I got the Power Tools record I remember that the track for me that seemed like you really let it all out was that tune Howard Beach Memories or Howard Beach Memoirs oh, yeah. or whatever he called it um, and it just opened up and you seemed to go yeah. to the heart of the matter in that I just haven't I haven't listened to that stuff for it, I don't even know if I ever listened to it <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling I know I have some records like that too that you get the CD in the mail and you're like oh wow geez I remember that I got a put this on but then you don't get to it yeah. wow any other questions from you guys you? are uh, decide to arrange a song I'm wondering have there been any tunes that you just absolutely love that it just didn't work you tried it a million ways it didn't feel like you were doing the song justice or when you wrap your head around it, are you always able to come up with something that you think is ready for prime time? Oh, I, I have tons of things that are just sitting there in the half-finished state, and sometimes it is because, like, I'm trying to put together this stuff for um, Willard Robeson second disc, and at the same time, oh. I'm trying to also have two other CDs I want to make. Um, and I'm going through a lot of his music. There's a tune... Uh, I guess I'll go back home this summer. You ever heard that? That's another tune that... I mean, you know, it's like... Honestly, I think I find like a tune like this, and I think you would probably be the person I want to hear play it. It has, it has all this movement. Realize I'm doing a different beat. Guess I'll go back home this summer. Should have gone there long ago. Anyway, and just something about the lyrics and all the movement. I've learned it, even though I obviously haven't played it in a while, but I can't figure out how I can do it that it's going to not seem really treacly or just kind of silly or overly sentimental, you know. I've changed a word here or there to add a little bit of darkness that I think the song needs. Like, the bridge is, um... After we've talked of everything Then I'll get a restless spell I'll go by the house where she used to live I hope she married well. <laughs> it's sort of like, it's, just, it's like really a sad kind of story, you know, but... Um, yeah, I find, I find that happens a lot. Um, that's why I think everyone else should do records of Willard Robeson. Do, do you know about this Van Dyke Parks thing? I, I know Jason knows about this, but some, a friend of mine interviewed him a few years ago and then was like, Van Dyke's talking to me about this record he wants to do that's all Willard Robeson music. Oh, yeah. And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, so, you know, I told him that you'd done a record of that stuff. So then Van Dyke and I were in touch a little bit and 
And he said, well, you know, what's the point? Like, you've already done it, kind of like that. And I was like, he's, like, more than anyone I can think of, Van Dyke is the guy that should be doing a Willard Robeson record. Yeah. Um, and I told him, you know, I would give him any materials he needs, like anything, just, you know, because I think he should really do it. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's you know another, him, man, he said, I wish someone would, that's, uh, if this was like, I don't know what time in, you know, Van Dyke should be like a national Try, just let him do whatever he wants whatever comes into his mind yeah. come on just let him do it yeah. you know let him do anything he wants to do yeah. take it maybe after you I'll send him an email and say like still waiting you should really just... yeah cause Van you know Willard was a guy that wrote these songs that are all kind of like quirky and didn't really find the right home they didn't fit into an easily categorized thing marketing wise he sang in a kind of like unconventional voice and he was an arranger and did all these arrangements for a full orchestra you know I should play you some of this stuff Uh Um, you know our friend Greg Cohen is you know with the program he's been doing in Berlin wound up doing one of the classes was all right. you need to learn some of Willard Robeson Willard Robeson music and I think he did Robeson and Henry Mancini oh, wow. in the same semester. And so I sent him a bunch of the materials, and he's had the students that he was working with in Berlin learning all this Robeson stuff. Wow, that's know. great. Huh. Speaking of which, have you visited him in Berlin? No. Because the sort of recording studio that you, situation that you're talking about, like an old studio in the back of some place, oh, yeah. still exists there. And, and like an East German yeah. studio or yeah. something? So he, yeah, so we went and did a record with the Irregulars, that group that you saw um, oh, the yeah. year in, and it was Scott Robinson and John Kelso and me and Greg oh, in man. East Berlin at a studio that Greg was connected with. And it's incredible. Like it, It's the old Stasi headquarters wow. for, for the Stasi radio. Like All East German propaganda radio was in this giant building, and the building's still sitting there, and... A ton of this, I mean, it's block after block after block of giant warehouses. And a ton of the buildings have, or at least two years ago when we were there, had windows still missing. And you know, yeah. But then you go into the main studio rooms and no one goes in there anymore. But it's we recorded in this room where they must have symphonies. And the walls had like hanging silk. And, you know, it was really wow. great That's to record awesome. in a place with... Yeah, they had mics up in the ceiling, you know, to pick up stuff. And it's the dumbest realization, but it was only recorded in, in a big room like that, that I realized that that thing that happens on some of my favorite records where suddenly, like, um, you know, someone like Gene Ammons or something opens up the biggest quality of their sound and it sounds like someone's dialing up the reverb. Yeah. That's because, obviously, yeah. they're triggering those yeah. mics at the top to like and I just never realized I was like oh he's reaching a different part of the room yeah that's why it sounds that way you know? yeah <laughs> so Scott and John you know got oh, into man. some of their stuff wow and that's... you could just hear some of their notes that rub together would then trigger things in the corner of the room it wow. was really fun wow it's so cool but you should get you should get over there and do I love the record that you did with Greg you should get over there and do it that was one. a tr- we did that in about five minutes. Yeah. I was, I man, I had yeah, another was chance fast. for that. Was that in Coney Island? Yeah, it was some, I don't know where, it was somewhere in he said some Brooklyn, studio somewhere way there. out, yeah. and just in, in like in a base. Oh, I know who owned it. Do you know? I know who it was. It was the guy who kind of runs the vaults at Sony. Yeah, well, he, it was a friend of his. Okay. And, and that one I used, that was, makes me want to get one. Of, I, it was a Fender, old Fender Champ amp. One of those, just with the volume and, mm-hmm. just yeah. the volume and on off. That's what Julian's using for all his I know. Now. And I, it was, I did because I'm always using reverb or something. At least reverb, maybe. Yeah. I, but I, that, I just I had that. too naked without reverb. Yeah, I, but I just, that's all I had. Just bam. 
and a Telecaster, you know, and it was, and we just, we better do this quick because we only got. And so uh, were you reading most of that stuff? Was, I think I was kind of. Because a bunch of them were, were Greg's originals. He, yeah, probably reading. So he had it together, what he wanted to do, and we just, but it was like really fast. I mean, just in one afternoon or less than an afternoon. But, well, yeah, he's so great. Record. But it's, I'm trying to remember, I wish I could remember the name of the guy at Sony. I know I thanked oh, him. Oh yeah, Mike Panico. Right, Mike Panico. Yeah, yeah, I got Panico. to go down, the, have you gone in I've there? I've never been, but Unbelievable. I can imagine. I was given his info by um, Vince Giordano, who has a 1920s, 30s like repertoire band that I played in years ago. And when I was doing the Robeson thing, I got in touch with Vince to see if he could help me finding out, find out some of the oh, publishing yeah. information and like who owns these, this stuff. So I wanted to do Still Run Around in the Wilderness, that song. And Vince was like, call Mike Panico because he's got all this information and yeah. so i got in touch with him and he was like no problem i'll get you the answer it'll just take me a couple of minutes you know let me, let me get right back to you and then he got back and he sent me actually a, a scan of the index card from the original yeah. recording session like written in fountain pen you know? I know and he was like i have the information for the flip side and i'm trying i think the flip side was tall timber which is a tune i know that van dyke likes um and he was like, I have all the publishing information for the flip side, but no information for still running around in the wilderness. Like, and ASCAP didn't have anything. Like, and that's the case with a bunch of this music that you realize like things do fall through the cracks. So that was something where oh, wow. I was never able to find it. And you know, I paid the Harry Fox royalties on the things that I was able to find, and I wrote some of the publishing houses asking, "Do you guys own the rights to this?" And never heard back. So you know, now someone will sue me. I figured like. Someone can come and see me, and I'll pay them what I owe them for the 500 records I sold. You know, I mean, it's like. Oh man. <laughs> but I've been meaning to make it down to Mike Panico's. Yeah, you should. Lair. It's pretty far out. Just those index cards. That that. That's how they kept track of everything, and he knows all that. Whatever these codes are, this means. And just the. Has the list of who played on the record. Or, right. But then there's photos. There's like filing cabinets with, like I looked in this Miles Davis thing, and you see, like just a, you know, a, a, a Manila envelope with a bunch of photos that are, you know, I remember this one from Kind of Blue, and then there's another one. Wow. Right next to it, which, you know, one you so haven't seen. So this is all stuff before. that just gets because Sony owns those companies now. I guess. They get. And then there's some the other package. place, I guess, that's where there's a serious thing that's underground somewhere out. <laughs> but this is, and just, you know, rows and rows of the, the albums by, their, I think they're in like numerical order from. Wow. But goes back, I think there's like, is there okay? And, you know, right. the, the uh, older too. stuff. Well, he was really, he was pissed that he didn't have it. And I gave him a whole list of tunes to look for. You know what, that's what, I gave him a list of tunes to look for, and he didn't have a, a few of them. And he was oh. really pissed. <laughs> like, it was, wow, you know, I wonder. I mean, you know, just think about all the bookkeeping and all the filing that goes into maintaining records like that. When you suddenly realize mm. that there's a bunch of stuff missing, it's like, Damn it! You know, <laughs> man. Yeah, I'll send. I'll send you. Guess I'll go back home this summer. You would play it much, much better than I <laughs> ever, ever could hope to. It would be beautiful. I think. I think the way to do it is to shelve the lyrics, and uh, you do it as an instrumental. It'd be beautiful. I have. You know, when I was first getting into the Robus and stuff. Um, I was playing in Vince's band and a lot of old timers would come down and listen to his band. A lot of people that, you know, loved old jazz and were at the time in their seventies and eighties, you know, and like, mm -hmm. so I've had cassette tapes of stuff just like kind of passed to me. Oh. Um, like, oh, I hear you might enjoy this, you know, 
I, in a couple of instances, I don't know who the people were. You know, it's just after a show, like I brought this for you to check out. And wow. I come home, and check it out. And one of them has Willard and Joe Venuti at home. And someone like put on the tape recorder and they're playing. Oh, man. And there's two instrumentals on there, one of which I have no idea what it is. Um, but it's a great tune. I don't even know what the title is or anything, but I want to put it on wow. volume two. But it just oh, it's just wow. the melody and Robeson accompanying him. Sorry, I can't play it to demonstrate. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't learned it. I haven't thought about it for a few, few years. But it's a tune that I think is gonna. It's a really beautiful one. What's next for you guys besides lunch? Uh, I don't know. This summer is not super busy for me. You know. I'd say like half of every month I'm different places, you know, than home. And then when I'm home, I'll probably be God willing with my wife and kid, you know. Just kind of more of the usual. You? Well, I'm actually home for the whole summer, which is a... That's amazing. I... And it's been it's already a couple months I've been home, which is, I'm. It would. It was a couple of years ago when I. I gotta just take a. I blocked off a six month, chunk where I'm, not getting on an airplane. So. That's amazing. But I can't believe how fast it's going by, and I haven't it felt like I haven't even landed yet. It's already been like two months since I got home. So. Yeah. I so was... it'll be over before I know it. Yeah, I was looking forward for months and months to this four-week period that I had just last month when I was like, I'm going to be free and I'm going to be home. And uh, and it didn't really happen, and it didn't seem like four weeks. If anything, it was like two weeks, but it was two weeks of kind of frantic. Like, yeah. I have to recover. I have to recover. <laughs> I know. Then it ended. <laughs> and... <laughs> I know exactly. And the thing is, you know, you exhaust yourself. <laughs> you exhaust yourself just putting all the effort into fixing yourself. <laughs> yeah, into I'm going to sleep and I'm going to relax. No, I know. That's I'm going to fix these aches. I'm do, I'm, that's what I've been doing mostly. <laughs> yeah. I'm putting so much energy into relaxing. I'm just about ready to have some sort of aneurysm or something. <laughs>